before I get started, I want to thank a number of people who put a lot of energy into this event to make it go. Uh, Steve Marshank promoted and organized this. He's been at it for months and months. Uh, Roy, Roy Tuckman, Roy of Hollywood, and Diane have, they have supported me and given generously of hundreds and hundreds of hours of their time to put these psychedelic ideas across. And believe me, you hang your ass out to dry when you take this position. Tim mentioned courage. Nobody has had the kind of courage that Roy and Diane have had to push that message uh, into this town. So we salute them. And uh, Eric Alley did the wonderful poster. He's done them for these events for years. He's a beautiful artist. Uh, Christian Duffy and Jim Messix are here to see that you find your seat and stay in it. And uh, we thank them for that. And last and certainly most importantly, uh, Kath Harrison McKenna, my partner in building the dream of botanical dimensions. I sit up here and take the limelight and the glory. It's Kath who fashioned botanical dimensions into the functioning entity that it is. She manages it from day to day. We had a $51,000 balloon payment that I talked to you about in Port Wainimi. It's paid off. It's finished. The land, the land in Hawaii will forever be uh, dedicated to the preservation of plants with medical significance and significance to the human family. And that credit all goes to Kat. So let's hear it for her. You all know that the rainforests of the world are disappearing at a tragic rate. And maybe that process can be halted through pressure on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and these enormous international agencies. But whether or not the clearing of the rainforest is halted, the loss of folk medicinal knowledge on the part of these tribal societies that have lived in balance and equilibrium and respect with nature for millennia, that is tragically going. There's no question about it. Because you can't put people into a museum diorama and ask them to parade around in jock straps while the rest of us drive BMWs. They move into the cities. These people work in the sawmills. They take jobs in the tourist industry. And 25, 50,000 years of medical knowledge is lost. And Tim did homage to the vegetables. Even in today's high-tech world, fully 75% of all the drugs, prescription drugs, other kinds of drugs, on the market, above ground, underground, come from plants. This is a priceless reservoir of uh, complex chemistry, but it's meaningless unless the human experiences, the human lore is preserved. And this is what Botanical Dimensions is about. We have collectors uh, in Peru, in other parts of the world, and we bring seeds, rootstock, living plants to Hawaii, and there these things are grown, as in a living library, toward the day when a more enlightened society will have the wisdom and the good sense to uh, team up with the vegetable world and create a more humane medicine, a more humane religion, that has some real life and life in it. So that's what we're doing out there. Any help any of you can give us, uh, we're deeply appreciative. Spread the word. Uh, since we began this project, many uh, imitators have sprung up. And this was our intent and our hope. And great good work is being done. Uh, so please support the conservation of folk, botanical, and medical knowledge.
So then before I dig into this, let me just explain how it'll work. I'll talk for a while, then there'll be an intermission, and then we'll come back and given however much time is left over, why there'll be a, a Q&A and, and we'll have a mic for you to line up behind. Okay. All right. First of all, thank you all for being here. I know we're up against the Grateful Dead, my favorite band. Uh, I'm going to quote them repeatedly. It's a thousand to one chance that this would happen, and it just shows the world is stranger than you can suppose. So, uh, the name of this talk is Unfolding the Stone. And I wanted to talk about this. It's a departure for me because I think we've just been through a real hammering over the past 10 months. I mean, if you've still got your optimism intact, and believe me, I do, uh, you've been through the fire. This has not been an easy 10 months for uh, the people of this planet or the planet itself. And so I want to sort of reach back tonight and invoke a vanished tradition get to the heart of it, and try to show how we can bring this forward in our lives to empower hope in the most dark of situations, and in fact to even make these dark situations the raw material of a clearer, stronger hope than might ordinarily be the case. A few days ago I was talking to a friend of mine, and he wanted to tell me the story of sitting in the presence of a 104-year-old Vietnamese monk. And the guy had basically kept his mouth shut, the monk, hadn't said much around the monastery where he just sort of cleans up. But then he announced he wanted to talk about meditation. And he opened his remarks by saying, we are all luminous beings. Why then? do we not appear before each other radiant in our illumination? And this is the conundrum of life. This is the problem. Uh, it was T.S. Eliot who said, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. And why is that? As psychedelic people, this is the problem that we grapple with in our own lives and when we look out at the world. You've heard me say many times, we have the vision, we have the money, we have the technology, but why can we not then appear before each other as radiantly luminous beings? And why cannot we reclaim our planet from toxification, disease, overpopulation, bonehead politics, you know the list. What's the hang-up here? What is the problem? Why is perfection so distant? Well, what I've learned from life and vegetables and travel and books can be summed up in two Greek words. It's the central message of, of the philosopher Heraclitus. And he was always my favorite philosopher, but whenever I would read about him, he was called the crying philosopher. And I had to live to be 44 years old to understand the poignancy of Heraclitus' message. He said, in a nutshell, Pantit Rea, all flows, all flows. Nothing lasts. Nothing is permanent. And this is the hardest message life has to teach. Because what it says is, your joy is transient, your anguish is transient, your fortune, your home, your dream, your moments of great uh, ecstasy, your moments of great insight, your moments of great empowerment, everything is flowing through your hands at the moment that you are aware of it. William Blake, 
who in a way set this engine going a couple of centuries ago, said, <clears throat> what is the price of experience? Is it bought for a song or wisdom for a dance in the street? No. It is bought with all that a man has, his wife, his home, his children. Now, this is not a pessimistic message, and William Blake was not a pessimistic guy. He was the same guy who told us that if we could but cleanse the doors of perception, we would perceive the world as it is, infinite, in a grain of sand. How can we take this poignancy, this sense of impermanence, and weld it into something which is paradoxically indestructible? and has meaning in our lives and gives us not only the strength to carry on, but the power to be exemplars, the power to stand up before other people and let them then feel the power of vision in the paradox of permanence in the face of the need for indestructibility. Well, to answer that question, I felt that we had to leave the narrow confines of 20th century thinking. And we had to reach back into the byways of human thought that have been, by most of us, somewhat passed over and forgotten, because after all, modern life makes great demands on us. It's enough to just keep your checkbook balanced and your insurance paid. We can't all spend our time delving in the libraries of uh, of the noetic and Gnostic and Hermetic and magical traditions. But I thought it was worthwhile to talk to you about this tonight because we have been through such a difficult 10 months. And it was also Heraclitus, the all flows guy, who said, all is war, all is war. And what he meant was everything occurs in the presence of its opposite and out of that, there is generated the friction, the heat, and the light that all comes together in an indissoluble package as part of life. So what I want to talk to you about tonight and how it relates to unfolding the stone is the notion of alchemy of all things. Alchemy, as I'm sure many of you know, is really the secret tradition of the redemption of spirit from matter. But many of you may imagine that alchemy is simply a, a discredited pre-scientific obsession of unbalanced minds interested in changing base metals into gold, lead into the stuff of commerce. This is the benighted reputation that alchemy has acquired in a century so given over to the literal and the material and the non-spiritual that it's lost all touch with the adumbrations of meaning that vibrate behind uh, the perceptions of the alchemist. The central conception of alchemy is the conception of the philosopher's stone. What is it? It's the universal panacea at the end of time. It's the chocolate cake that your mother made once a week when you were a child. The panis supersubstantialis. It's all things to all men and all women. If you are hungry, you eat it. If you're dirty, you shower under it. If you need to go somewhere, you sit on it and you fly there. If you have a question, it answers it. It's something that the human mind senses in itself and related to, invoked, worshipped over centuries before the slow rise of the patriarchy and rationalism and materialism turned it into a myth, a fairy tale. It is not a myth or a fairy tale. It is the burning primary reality that lies behind the dross of appearances. 
Alchemy is based on a philosophy called Hermeticism that was developed in the first and second centuries by Gnostic thinkers, Greeks, Jews, people inside the Roman Empire as it was beginning to show the first signs of degradation and decay, who felt a profound disaffection with their world. A disaffection that on the scale of those times was as profound as our own existential disaffection. And the Hermetic philosophers drew back from the rise of Christianity with its doctrine of the fall of man and original sin and the stain of Adam and Eve and that whole thing and took a different tack and made two points which I think we need to recover and live out for ourselves. And the first point was that man means men and women, human beings, are divine beings, not lower than the angels, higher than the angels. The message of the alchemical and hermetic thinkers, and the Corpus Hermeticum actually uses the phrase, man is God's brother. We have no idea what it would mean in our own lives if we could throw off the notion of ourselves as fallen beings. We are not fallen beings. When you take into your life the gnosis of the light-filled vegetables, the psychedelic plants that have stabilized the same societies of this world for millennia, the first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from realms of unimaginable power and light, and you will return to those realms. The second point that these philosophers wanted to make was that fate can be overcome. Fate can be overcome. Now, for the Greco-Hellenic world, what that meant was the starry engines of the machinery of fate that they saw strewn across the night sky because they were uh, intensely aware of the power of the zodiac, the stellar shells inhabited by demons that extended out to the unimaginable imperium of the All-Father that was beyond fate. And into that world of astrological fatedness, which is such a strong idea for the Greek mind, the Hermeticists announced fate can be overcome. And they had a novel answer for how this could be done. It can be done through magic, a word not often enough heard in the present world. The overcoming of fate is achieved through magic, and then the stellar machinery becomes not an invasive force into one's life, but an empowering force. Now, some of us may believe in astrology and some of us may not. We are all strongly influenced by the notion of fate, of our powerlessness in an existential world. Jean-Paul Sartre said, nature is mute. And we, embedded in the media-dense, message-dense, programming-dense matrix of these hyper-societies that we have created, often feel, I think, like hapless atoms running endlessly according to the blueprints and programs of unseen masters, whether it's the banking industry, Madison Avenue, whoever. We tend to disempower ourselves. We tend to believe that we don't matter. And in the act of taking that idea to ourselves, we give everything away to somebody else, to something else. So the rebirth of a sense of the stone and its possibility within each of us entails these two ideas, our divinity and our power to overcome fate. There is no uh, inevitability in our lives unless we submit to the idea of inevitability and then give ourselves over to it. 
Okay. Okay. I wish there were more jokes, but it's just been such a tough go. It's been a tough go, I have to tell you. Where can we look in the world to see some confirmation of what I'm saying? How can we draw it down from being, you know, an airy-fairy rap of a, a bardic Irishman? Well, I think that the place to look is history. Now, if you go to the academies, to those ivory towers that Tim was talking about, and ask, what is history? They will tell you that it's a random walk, an endlessly pointless fluctuation. Empires rise and fall, migrations of people come and go, that it is essentially meaningless. I don't believe this. I don't even think there's strong evidence for it. Because what I perceive when I look at the world, not only the world of history, but the world of nature which out of which history has emerged, I see novelty, something wonderful, maddening, paradoxical, and ever-increasing, ever more conserved. Every iota of novelty that comes into existence is somehow saved and passed on. That's why when we uh, walk or drive down Melrose, we see Egyptian fashion motifs, we see fashion statements drawn from the 14th century, the 2nd century, Assyria, Egypt, uh, Angkor Wat. All of the novelty of history coalesces in the living moment. It's always been that way. Every society in the moment of its existence has lived as a resonance, a completion, and uh, a distillation, good alchemical word, a distillation of what has preceded before. And so the alchemical idea that spirit can be redeemed from matter begins to get teeth when you connect the idea of spirit up to the idea of novelty which has not ordinarily been done. But, you know, novelty is the life of the party, and the life of the party is to be high-spirited. And this is what we need to focus on as the thread in the dark labyrinth of the prison of the material world that can lead us back to the light. The universe is an engine for the production of novelty. It always has been since the first moment of the Big Bang 20, 25 billion years ago. Simpler states have been replaced by more complex states, which have then set the stage for yet greater complexity. Well, the drift of this then is that the emergence of language and tools and culture and higher ideals like courage and love and self-sacrifice, these are not uh, flukes, sports, mistakes. These are further steps along the way in the process of the great alchemical furnace of being, heating and casting and dissolving and recasting and purifying and recasting alchemical gold. And so hard as the world may appear, uh, dark as the hour may appear, in reality we exist in a dimension of greater opportunity, greater freedom, greater possibility than has ever been. The challenge then is to not drop the ball, is to know this, and to act on it and to slough off all the leeches and backhandlers and weasels and crypto-fascists who want to deny that and turn man into a machine for their own purposes. Alchemy has always perceived this and has delineated stages in the transformational process and these stages uh, are uh, worth talking about, not in the details, but in, in 
the two bipolar states which define this. They used a bastard Latin, and they called them the negredo and the albedo. The negredo is the precondition for transformation. And what is it? It's shit. It's detritus. It's flotsam. It's debris. It's being HIV positive. It's being deep into your fourth marriage and sinking fast. It's bankruptcy. It's, uh, you know, serum hepatitis. It's the inevitable dark night of the soul that comes upon us. And these dark nights of the soul come upon all of us. Nobody gets through this world without a little dung raining down on them, believe me. I mean, you may evade it for decades, but then there will be a knock on the door. You know, it's said that uh, the millstones of fate grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. So what do we do with that? Well, the answer is, we welcome it. This is what the alchemists awaited. The negredo, the prima materia, the dark matter, the chaos, the chaos that is the precondition then for redemption. And God knows we've got lots of chaos right now. I mean, we have war, famine, revolution, millions of homeless people on the move. The nation state is dissolving. The relief agencies of the world can't keep up. The various uh, uh, secret societies, mafias and cabals that have always tried to tie us into chains, they're all working overtime. We are in the negredo condition. Hallelujah. This means, this means, that the kissing has to stop, but the fun can begin, the real fun. The other end of this bipolar condition in alchemy was called the albedo, or albedo, depending on whether or not you came from a coal mining town in Colorado like I did. The albedo, the whitening. And that means that out of the chaos can come a new beginning, a new reality, a new hope. And then the process is one of, and the you see these alchemists existed in an, uh, a philosophically more naive, we quote, more naive world than we do. So they actually projected onto the processes of matter their own interior psychic condition. So they did work with matter and fire and furnaces and retorts. And what they would do is they would take uh, the primal materia, lead or excrement or something else, and then they would heat it and turn it to ash and then calcinate the ash or pour solvents through the ash and get an extract and then heat that and sublimate it. And out of this, almost as a footnote, came modern chemistry. But that was not the important side of it. The important side of it was that they were projecting mental states onto the swirling retorts of their laboratory. It was like a magical mirror for them. It was, in fact, dare we say the P word, it was psychedelic. What psychedelic means is getting your mind out in front of you by whatever means necessary so that you can relate to it as a thing in the world and then work upon it. So from the negredo to the albedo, there were a series of uh, these stages. Now I said a few minutes ago that magic was the key. And by magic, I mean the reclaiming and the reconstruction of language to a sufficient degree that it becomes at first possible, then probable, then inevitable to each one of us that miracles can happen. Miracles can happen. 
The Grateful Dead have a song. We need a miracle every day. We do need a miracle every day. Well, is that too tall an order? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, years ago, one of these talking vegetables said to me, said, mind conjures miracles out of time. Out of time. Time is the prima materia on which the alchemical process works. The alchemists, uh, again, in their naive way, believed that uh, precious metals, diamonds, gold, sapphires, actually grew in the earth. Because for this alchemical point of view, everything was a lie. And my friend Rupert Sheldrake is leading the charge to create a new birth of that perception inside science. The idea that nature, all of nature, is alive. Not simply organic, cellular nature, but that the Earth itself is a living being. So mind conjures miracles out of time. And the proof that this can be done, and it's an incontrovertible proof, and I defy any naysayer or bring down to overcome it, is ourselves. We are the proof that mind can conjure miracles out of time. If it weren't for us, there would just be birds and foxes and coral reefs and glaciers. But nature was not content with that level of novelty. A million years ago, a hundred thousand years ago, nature grew discontented and said, you know, let's raise the ante. Let's go to higher stakes poker in this planetary game. Let the monkeys speak. <laughs> Let them build fires. Let them elaborate tools. Let them march forward onto the stage of creation. And remember I said the hermetic faith was that humankind was the brother, could act as the brothers and sisters of God, not motes in God's creation, but co-partners in the invocation out of being of yet greater novelty. Why? For play, for fun, just the cosmic madness of it all, the pure cussedness of it all, uh, to raise the stakes higher and higher and higher. Now, I keep going back to this thing of can it be done, because I want to convince you, because I'm so certain. Uh, I love Herman Melville and his rhetoric. And friends of the whale, bear with me. Uh, <clears throat> for Herman Melville, the whale was not the endangered creature it is today. It was uh, the dark cosmic god of Christianity that haunts us and tries to pull us down. And there's a wonderful speech in Moby Dick where Starbuck, the first mate, you remember wimpy little Starbuck, he stood for Christian right reason. And he says to Captain Ahab, to seek revenge on a dumb brute seems blasphemy. And Ahab says, blasphemy, Starbuck? Speak not to me of blasphemy. I would strike out the sun if it insulted me. For could it do that, then could I do the other. For there is ever a sort of fair play. And that's the point of that rap. There is a sort of fair play. You've been told from the cradle that the deck was stacked against you. Fall of man, original sin, so forth and so on. It's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. There is a sort of fair play. And if you can get in touch with that in your life, you know, when Muhammad wouldn't come to the mountain, the mountain came to Muhammad. That's fair play. And if you can have that perception, the world will begin to work for you. It will begin to move 
toward you as the mountain moved toward Muhammad. The mushroom said to me once, uh, nature loves courage. Nature loves courage. And I said, what's the payoff on that? And it said, it shows you that it loves courage because it will remove obstacles. You make the commitment and nature will respond to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles. Dream the impossible dream and the world will not grind you under. It will lift you up. This is the trick. This is what all these uh, uh, teachers and philosophers who really counted, who really touched the alchemical gold, this is what they understood. This is the shamanic dance in the waterfall. This is how magic is done. It's done by hurling yourself into the abyss and discovering that it's a feather bed. And there's no other way to do it. Uh, this is why I have always taken the position that as modern people, you know, we can't go out and uh, set armies marching or launch religions and who would want to anyhow. But to the people who say adventure has fled, it's all humdrum. I just know, you know, that they have forgotten the five grams of psilocybin sitting in their refrigerator. <laughs> I mean, Magellan may have had excitement rounding the horn, but you in your living room later tonight can put him in the shade if you have the courage to do the things that are necessary to do. And we know what they are. And of course, the first thing to do is to tell society to fuck off because they don't know what's going on. This is a matter between the person and the plant, the person and the planet. And all the detritus of history, all the games that people have tried to lay on you, you know, they just want to get you down in the ditch that they're in. We know this because Aboriginal societies have never broken the faith. The living gnosis is still there, not for people who paint themselves blue and dance around buck naked, but for us as well. But it takes an act of courage, not a weekend at Esalen, uh, not uh, a, a trip to the ashram where, where they tell you that if you'll sweep up for a dozen years, then they'll hand on a whammy. No, it, it, the speed with which you can reach death is under 45 seconds if you know where the elevator shaft is. And you do, you do. I don't have to tell you, I've been telling you. Uh, well, so, uh, there's one more alchemical metaphor or stage that I want to mention here. Uh, because I think it, it refers to this psychedelic possibility. Not all the alchemists included this stage in their, in their uh, recensions of the work. But for me, I think it's central. Again, in their church, uh, bastardized church Latin, they called it the cow de pavones, the peacock's tail. Now, the physical basis of this is, if you've ever played around with metal and fire, you know that there are certain metals that when they pass through a certain temperature range, uh, iridescent colors play across the surface and sometimes even freeze. And in uh, uh, the glazing of pottery at low temperatures in Raku, what these pottery masters are aiming for are these wonderful iridescent surfaces that play across the glaze and then can be frozen into it. Well, this is the peacock's tail. And uh, in alchemy, this was thought to precede the final whitening, the passage into the pure, uh, the goal, really. 
And rather than see the present world as exclusively a veil of tears and a black prison, and none of these metaphors are mutually exclusive, you see, the alchemist, the great strength of alchemical thinking and the way in which it is completely antithetical to science, and in fact why science has so much contempt for it, is because the alchemist had the wisdom to see that everything occurs in the presence of its opposite. That it's not either or, it's both and. They call this the coincidentia oppositorum, the, co the coincidence of opposites, the union of opposites. This is a great truth, because I think all of us live under the rubrics of, am I good? Am I bad? Am I lazy? Am I obsessed? And the answer is that it is never one or the other. It does a tremendous injustice to being to ignore the union of opposites. Now science, in order to do its work, which is essentially a technological work, not a deep philosophical work, it's a minor art science. That's all it is. It's a minor art. It's the art of the physically possible. But it has presumed to be the arbiter of all thought all feeling, all work. My God, the, the hubris of René Descartes to divide the world into the primary and secondary qualities. And what are the primary qualities? Motion, uh, 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 mass, spin, momentum. And what are the secondary qualities? Color, feeling, taste, tactility. It tells you that you're nothing. You never touch reality. You live in that world of sense and therefore can only aspire to the real world through some kind of mathematical disembowelment of your own, what your own body, what your own feelings are telling you. So in the Cow de Pavone, the peacock's tail, this is where the contradictions meet and generate heat and light and an excruciating sense of poignancy and meaning and identity. And our world, as we experience it tonight, is quintessentially, another good alchemical word, is quintessentially that coincidentia oppositorum. Now, where do we meet this most dramatically in our own lives? I think we meet it in uh, the phenomenon of birth, of birth. If you had just parked your flying saucer in the bushes and uh, came from a world where sexuality was unknown and people were groaning vats or something, and you came upon a woman in the act of giving birth, it would appear to be a catastrophe in progress a tragedy at the limit of tragedy. Blood is being shed, anguish is on the surface, real agony pervades the situation. And yet, and yet, nature in her wisdom has bound pain and ecstasy, death and completion, regeneration and dissolution, into that experience in such an indissoluble fashion that no woman can miss the point. No woman can miss the point. Unfortunately, men have traditionally averted their eyes. This has gone on in a hut at the edge of the village. Nobody wanted to be there. Maybe the shaman would be there, but he was loaded in order to be there. And the mystery of mysteries go on, goes on outside the sight of men. Now, in our world, we are caught in this kind of metaphor, a cosmic birth, a birth of planetary scale is underway. Uh, there is agony. There is no doubt about it. 
I remember an embryologist who once taught me pointed out that the fetus in the womb is literally sculpted by the hand of death, that the immature hand of the fetal organism is a webbed claw, and that it isn't that the flesh retracts to form the human hand, it's that the cells in between die and slough off into the amniotic fluid and are carried away. The, the fetal child is literally sculpted into life by the hand of death. And our world is in this kind of a circumstance. There are no rational solutions at this point. We are now in the hands of the miracle makers, the shamans, the mind of the planet, the life of the ocean, and the atmosphere. And it's going to get tougher. And so we have to forge the indestructible adamantine stone of alchemical hope, because heavier challenges lie ahead. A uh, hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, I cannot but imagine that this planet will be empty of human beings. Not because we have become extinct, but because we have gone to our fate. And it's unimaginable at this moment because we are in the planetary birth canal. We are at the peak of transition right now. And the walls are literally closing in. We are being suffocated. We are fighting like a strangled man to try and save ourselves. And yet we have to believe and I invite you to educate yourself about the history of the planet. There is no reason not to believe that we will come through. We will come through. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There is a meaning to history, but it's an alchemical meaning. History is a vast alchemical engine for the forging of an alchemical humanity. And I don't have the answers, believe me. I don't know whether we go to another star, whether we become eight angstroms high and all live in a block of metal underneath Mount Everest, whether we march off to the heart of the sun. The scenarios are endless because the human imagination has such a power to bootstrap itself to higher and higher levels. What would Paleolithic man have made of the, the religion of Pharaonic Egypt? What would the pharaohs have made of the engines of war and hydraulic machinery created by the Romans? What would the Gothic uh, scholastic uh, enlightenment have made of the age of cybernetics, psychedelics, and virtual reality? The imagination is the alchemical deus ex machina that can lift us out of time, out of the negredo of history, and into higher and higher and higher states of being. Now, there is no reason to simply then ride along in this process, because another perception of the alchemist that is central to getting this all lined up so that it works is the idea of the macrocosm and the microcosm. What does that mean? It means that the world truly is fractal in the most profound sense, meaning that what is going on on some very large scale is condensed, intensified, and recapitulated on smaller scales so that the dynamics of a love affair are the dynamics of an empire. Both are the dynamics of the evolution, expansion, and extinction of a species. There is only one way that things can happen. And whether we're talking about microphysical events or the life of an entire solar system, the curve of binding energy is going to be the same. So that means that this redemption of spirit from matter that is the historical process that we are embedded in, we can do our part 
by working on our small section of this, which is ourself. This is why alchemy was so fascinating to the Jungian uh, psychologists, because they saw that this work of redeeming spirit from matter is nothing more than the work of redeeming the self from the contaminated dross of the traumatized and damaged psyche that we each inherit from our passage through the parental um, shit pile. We each have that gift to deal with. That negredo is within ourselves. And this is why we're in therapy, and this is why we take psychedelics and meditate or do whatever we do, because we all have this dross within us, and this is a great gift. It means that we can begin consciously the process of distillation and sublimation and casting of ourselves into that golden being, that luminous creature that this 104-year-old Vietnamese monk uh, sensed and evoked uh, to my friend. But it's more than that. We do that, we do that alchemical work to perfect our own sense of the union of opposites, our own sense of the presence of the living alchemical stone within, in order that we may then participate, act in, and be part of the transformation of the planet. And it is an immense transformation. And there is no reason to doubt it, because the emergence of organic life from what preceded it is as dramatic a miracle as anyone could imagine. The emergence of language from mute bestiality, which is only 100,000 years in the past, is as dramatic a miracle as anyone could imagine. The emergence of a planet instantaneously unified by electricity and media is, and this is only 50, 60 years in our past, it's still going on, is as dramatic a miracle as anyone could imagine. It's absolutely irrational to not be filled with the fire of consuming hope. You just have to overcome the leveling that we inherit from these empty existential scientific ideas. And when we do that, and lift our eyes to the real, living, spiritually uh, empowered reality that exists in nature, in society, in our lover, in ourselves, then you see that the peacock's tail, the cow de pavones, is a, a transcendental object at the end of time. An enormous... Uh, unspeakable something that beckons across the historical landscape, that casts an enormous shadow that reaches clear back to the earliest moments of the universe, that we have always been in the grip of that iridescent, strange attractor that has propelled our poetry, our art, our best moments have always been when a tiny scintilla, another good alchemical word, a tiny spark of that alchemical completion burned for a moment in our mind, in our life, in our perception. And we occupy a special position in regard to this. Millions, thousands of generations of human beings have come and gone and could only glimpse this in the ecstasy of eroticism and psychedelic empowerment and ritual magic. But we are the last people. Beyond us lies the mystery. If we have but the courage to move forward into that abyss, to believe that nature will reward the dreamer, then we can complete that wonderful Irish toast which says, may you be alive at the end of the world.
because it's that close. It cannot wander much longer. All of the preconditions have been, been met and the peacock's tail grows daily whiter and more radiant and more brilliant as we sense now, breaking into our dreams, breaking into our waking lives, the presence of this attractor. It has always given people meaning, but we are the privileged inheritors of that meaning, and we have then the privilege of putting it all together in one piece and standing ready at the end of history to go into the mystery and be completed. So that's the end of my song. Take a break and we'll be back in 15 minutes and if you've got questions, and God, I hope you do, we'll deal with them. Thank you very, very much. Do you know what insomniac, dyslexic philosophers do? They sit up all night wondering if dog really exists. <laughs> it's also an intelligence test. <laughs> uh, also, I'd like to point out to you, just to keep you current, that uh, Nina Graboy, who is an old friend of mine and of Tim's, uh, has a new book out called One Foot in the Future. And this is a lady who lived a life that went from the center of Nazi Europe to Millbrook and beyond. And it's a wonderful book. It's out in the bookstores, and I just call your attention to it. Okay, let's have some questions here. Yeah, hi. Uh, once one has acquired the bundle weed, how does he consume it? Technical questions here, detail freaks, cooks, and recipe mongers. Uh, for the benefit of those not initiated into this, it's interesting. Uh, you know, aboriginal human beings have searched the world for psychedelic sources and have been, such as in the Amazon, very successful, but not uh, exhaustively successful. So that it's recently become known uh, in the phytochemical literature that a plant, Desmanthus elenoiensis, which this gentleman is referring to, the Illinois bundle weed, appears to have the, one of the highest concentrations of dimethyltryptamine of any plant that's been looked at, and it has no history of aboriginal usage. And uh, the question is how to activate this into a usable psychedelic. Uh, probably uh, the way to do it would be to attempt to create an analog to the South American drug, plant drug, ayahuasca, by combining the bundle weed with a North American source of a beta carboline, such as harmine, which is what's in ayahuasca and that would activate it. And the obvious candidate for that would be uh, a uh, succulent plant that grows in the deserts of New Mexico and uh, uh, Nevada, Pergamon harmala. And Pergamon harmala combined with Desmanthus elenoiensis in the correct proportions would probably deliver a stunning psychedelic experience. Would you trick. eat it or, or smoke it? Oh, drinking. You would you boil drink? them together. No, smoking you can't. It's too diffuse in these things. No, you would, uh, you would perform an alchemy. You would boil the two for many hours in a large volume of water, pour off the wash, add new water, boil more hours, pour off the wash, combine the two fractions, get rid of the physical material, and drive it down until it looks like thick coffee. But, you know, don't be consumed by your uh, alchemical investigations. I mean, proceed carefully with this stuff because it's going to work if you get it right.